just remember the, the actual face being pushed in. <laughs>
and it, I think it's part of the reason it's become so popular, is that it's based on a reality that we can all understand and know and live with, and it doesn't start off on some different planet. It starts off within everybody's uh, frame of reference. And so things are far more frightening when they come out of your own sitting rooms than they do if they come from you know, in outer space and they come around the corner of the block. That's part of the reason. And technically, um, I mean, you didn't get to go on holiday like most of the cast. I no, I didn't. Um, I'm stuck in the back of the studio with nobody to act with against blue cloth. Mm. Was, that, was that difficult? Um, it was fair because it's much easier when you're acting to act with someone and get some sort of reaction. Mm. And it was, the eye light was very important and I had to make sure that I kept looking at the exact same spot and I had somebody mark the wall yes. with a thing. And then the, the other actors were fed through on the speaker. And so it was, so, it was sort of in real time, you weren't... It was in real time, uh, yeah. Yeah. they wouldn't do that now, but it, then it was in real time, which is quite good. Actually. So the, the other actors were actually on the set in another part of the same yeah. studio? And you but I couldn't see them. Yeah. 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 It has to be very tricky. And um, there's, a, there's a scene in which you um, appear as a little sort of baby demon and gradually swell to 30 feet high or whatever it is. Was, was this, um, this take an incredibly long time? Or was this a it little... did take quite right a long time, yes. Yeah. Uh, he was talking earlier on about locking off the camera. Yes. Yeah. You have to lock off the camera and make sure that when you, sorry, when you pull it back, everything is... I don't understand the technical thing of it, but it takes an awful long time standing about getting hot and sweating. Falling off your back. And then uh, a couple of years later, you reappeared as, as another of uh, the super villains who menaced Pertwee in his uh, years as the Doctor. You were Omega in, uh, in The Three Doctors, another that tall right. and resonant sort of character. <laughs> um, was, that, uh, was that largely as a result of the all? I think it probably was, yes. They wanted something tall with a loud voice. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Very well remembered story, but uh, perhaps the production <coughs> values left a little to be desired compared with the demons. Um, yes, I, yes. I think that, that um, Omega deserved a, a better sort of home. In fact, Lenny May, I remember when I saw the set for um, Omega's palace, or I can't remember what it was called, but thing on it, anyway, Black Hill, yes. Eva came very close to tears and said, this isn't really good enough, I wanted something absolutely amazing to spend in for this man to inhabit. However, just have to go ahead. Now, you were um, underneath your mask, um, invisible. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. So, presumably, that, that involved you wearing some sort of a balaclava or something. Uh, yes, I had to wear a sock over my head at one point when I removed the mask. And I remember when we came to do that bit, I had this yellow sock, I think it was, over my head. I took the mask off, and there was a cue to, to do something or turn or speak or whatever it was. And of course, the, studio manager or floor manager was waving like mad and I was doing nothing because I couldn't see nothing but yellow sock. And that was a great hiatus while they thought I'd got blind. <laughs> and so they had to crawl along the floor and tap me on the toe instead. Mm. And what was it like um, menacing three doctors at once? So it was great fun, that. great fun. And, and a very comfortable time because yeah. the other monsters I've done have been sweaty, sticky, nasty yes. creatures with this. Would actually keep your trousers on underneath all that old cloak, and the mask was comfortable. You could breathe. You couldn't see very well. John Pertwee, I remember, kept moving me because I was in his way. You couldn't see the camera. Excuse me, Steve. He said, "You move," and then the director said, "We move back, please." I see. <laughs> so, uh, so we did this little tango. <laughs> Oh, that's fun, huh? So I've got some lipstick at the door. Oh, we've got 
Have you ever noticed that if you don't touch something like that, you just go, you'll never go like that, you'll just look at it. Okay, take six. Have you done? Bastard! That's what? God knows I haven't found out yet. 
I mean, I only found out the other day that Linford was in it as a bloody Nazi. Well, that figures, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's funny, he's in it as two Nazis, because Hemmings is in it, and Hemmings is loosely based on Linford. Yeah, that's true, actually, yeah. But there's also a moment where all Hemmings' troopers go out of control. And Hemmings is yelling, for God's sake, get a grip on yourself. Linford! Jonathan Powell, thank God. Jonathan Pyatt. And uh, then, aside from that, the only real reason we've got written in of any of the old Martins, that is, is the one I'm going to kill you, Martin. Down the hill. Yeah, even I know that, and I'm pissed. Stephen. I got my bag out of your car. Hang on. Will somebody hold this, idiot? <laughs> I'm not an idiot. I know which bloody way I'm going. Well, head up. <laughs> And the next thing you know, he's filming you in the most embarrassing situation. <laughs> Involved in a 
family hijack, or a family kidnapping. Um, and apparently I look very much like the manager of a Tesco supermarket in uh, Ipswich, which I, which I did because he actually came on location and was, uh, was around the place. Terrifying story. Um, villains break into the house with sawn-off shotguns and hold my wife and two sons most of the night and then take my wife and sons off somewhere, I know not where, uh, and on peril of, of their safety, you know, I have to go and get all the money from Tesco's safe and stick it in bags and leave it in a car park. Um, it was a fearsome, fearsome scenario. Not the very best script in the world because it came out of um, police files, you know, so, uh, but nonetheless, the situation was strong enough. And I'm happy to say they got a result from it. They caught all the, the people involved, all the, all the villains, which is good. There are things we don't know about John Leeson, like this is the man who on 4.30 on Channel 4 says, and now we're going to meet the 15 who will become the one. Something like that, yes. yes. I've, I've been hiding behind Channel 4's bum, 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 bum for quite a while um, as a freelance. Uh, so I'm not sort of a uh, dyed-in-the-wool television announcer. But it's rather nice at Channel 4 because they let you write all your own scripts. And you view all the programmes in advance, which is wonderful, because you can actually write what engages you. You can find something in the programme that you like and interests you and write about it in the way you want to. Although they only allow you, you know, just a few seconds to do it in. So you're a, you're, you're, you're a short run operative, you know, it's the, the loneliness of the, of the short distance runner rather than anything else. Did you do that live, as it were, is that? Yes, that's all done live. Yes, the, the programme trailers are obviously packaged beforehand. Right. You know, those are all BT events. But uh, you're there live. You have to be there just in case the programme breaks down. Right. Have you, have you done any sort of fill-ins for breakdowns? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I have, uh, there's a colleague of mine who, um, from the BBC, who used to have terrible trouble with spoonerism. Mm -hmm. It was awful. It was a very nice announcer. But he, I remember once I was there and he announced something as being played, uh, some music being played by the band of the Royal Arsk Artillery. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate. No, I mean, breakdowns happen, um, and it depends on the nature of the program, how you do a, a, an apology. I mean, if it's something light and fairly wacky, then you can make sort of looking for rubber bands noises and things like that to try and get the thing started again. But if it's, um, you know, Channel 4 News or whatever, well, they usually take care of their own breakdowns or serious programs, then you, you do treat it seriously and you don't tell people that there's a breakdown because they know they can see it's a breakdown mm. they don't insult their intelligence but simply say um, hold on folks we'll be back as soon as we can it, it does mean it's sort of you know one o'clock in the morning you'll be sitting there waiting for band and to begin oh, one o'clock uh, uh, last wednesday i was there till 3 25 in the morning uh, on a hindi film called chori chori which i'm sure you all saw great lovely. yes good yes wonderful wasn't it yes still coming the tune. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Beatles about recently and hid hideous sort of. Oh, oh yeah. dear. Dear, how embarrassing. Has anybody ever attacked you? Well, a bit, yes, very nearly. Um, very nearly. The very first one I ever did, which was years ago, and it was called Game for a Laugh. Um, we went up to, oh, somewhere up north, somewhere near Leeds, I think. And the idea was um, this is a little brief scenario behind it. A lady who had. A sort of gravel patch at the bottom of her garden and a flagpole in this gravel patch found that buses were always stopping there. It wasn't a bus stop, it wasn't an official bus stop at all, but there were, buses were always disgorging passengers at the bottom of her little garden and they were walking all over it. And she was getting really annoyed about it. So her, her daughter decided to set her up. And so she wrote to the programme and said, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually dig her into something rather Splendid. So the program said yes. And uh, <coughs> one day, daughter took mother off shopping, put a little radio mic in her bag, and they were driving back home. And what did they see? They saw a great JCB with a um, bus shelter, a really solid bus shelter being deposited onto her garden as she arrived. Of course, she 
the language in the car. <laughs> Leaps were in it. It was absolutely formidable. Um, and she was wound up before she ever got out of the car. Mm. Um, and then, of course, she went to find her husband, who was in the scam. He knew what was going on. And it, you know, he, she berated her husband for being ill at letting these people come and do this. Because nothing to, there is, this isn't a bus stop. It isn't anything to do with buses. Why have I got a bus shelter? And, of course, five minutes later, of course, the man from the bus company comes. And I was playing all these sort of jobs worth, real sort of official people with grey suits, a bit like John Major, I suppose. Um, getting her to accept this bus shelter, actually having her sign for it. I was very apologetic, terribly apologetic, because she should have had this bus shelter six months ago. She's been on the list for this bus shelter. You know, and she, you, you, you are Mrs. Stevens, aren't you? you know, and this is your address, isn't it? Well, it's, look, it's down here, black and white. So you've got, will you sign for it? <laughs> and she was getting higher and higher and higher. She was absolutely livid. Um, I very nearly got laid out. I certainly had scorch marks on the front of my shirt. And when Jeremy Beadle appeared, when he revealed himself, and if that's the right expression, um, <laughs> um, she was a fan of the programme, but didn't recognise him at all. She was too far gone. And it took her about half an hour to spiral down again to, to sanity. You know, but to, The programme has to be very careful, mm. also, that uh, its punters are researched in some depth, they haven't got heart defects, and you know, they're not going to fall down dead, having been wound up so high. <laughs> right. Anyway, yeah, that's just one story. Uh, the various people have uh, started to recognise you in the street now as John Major. Ah, yes, yes. Well, I, have the, I don't have these John, these aren't John Major specs this morning, but I do have a pair of John Major specs. And uh, when John Major was um, appointed the coup, the putsch, or whatever it's called, sorry, I have that. That pee popped. I'm terribly sorry, my um, The mic's still sensitive. It's still sensitive. Yeah, no, mind. Um, people kept stopping. Have, have you ever been told you look like... Yes, 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 yes. I was always being stopped as a, as a sort of John Major look-alike. But I can't do his voice, unfortunately. <coughs> Steve Nalen might be able to manage. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Put ourselves up, please. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it was hard work simply because the costume, which was wonderful, it was invented by a Frenchman. It would be done all sorts of wonderful mm -hmm. um, costumes for, for films and things. And with, you know, I had a face mask made, one of these sort of clay masks with straws up the nose, with all model, molded to me. It was rather terrifying having a mask made for you like that. Um, but it was, it was hard work because the costume was so, so hot. And you were working in studio, a quite small studio, with heavy studio lights going. And when you've got uh, kids' programmes or comedy programmes, they light everything up like crazy, making everything look very nice and bright. Uh, we did, I think, three shows a week, three, three programmes in the camp per week, and that was really hard graft. Mm. Uh, my co-presenter, um, David Cook, um, is now a very distinguished novelist. I'm not sure whether he still acts, but he's, uh, he was quite a chap. But um, Geoffrey Hayes, who took mm. over as, as a presenter of Rainbow, he and I were in rep together. Right. Years ago, and uh, I think he's—I think he's even doing it now. Yes, he's still there. Yes. 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 Jeffrey's now about eighteen. Grey-haired teenager yeah. now. Ah, morning. <laughs> <laughs> How are you getting on with the steps? Are you learning the steps? You can't take it out. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> Keep at it. Yeah, that was a wonderful thing. Was, um, the, the designers uh, on, on Doctor Who on, on the programmes kept going spare when they realised K-9 was going to be in any of the stories because they couldn't put any steps, mm. any, any different heights and things in, in their sets. Um, I mean, the, the original K-9 would just fall apart if it came to a sill iron across, across a door. Um, this particular model is absolutely fantastic, mm. totally lifelike, I mean, well, totally, uh, uh, a total facsimile. Uh, and quiet. Mm. He, he could actually creep up behind one and shoot one in the uh, back of the knee. <laughs> <laughs> actually, thinking about height relationships and acting, that lack of stairs must have really limited some of the things that could be done in terms of... It probably did, yeah. yes. It probably did. Mm. Uh, so there were, there were certain uh, disadvantages of having K-9 around the place. Mm. But, uh, oh my yeah. goodness. Yep. Oh. He does everything. Fully functional, aren't you? Wonderful. Master? <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick question from out there, please. 
That's a very good question. <laughs> is the face still modelled on yours, even on this? I suppose it is. I suppose. I mean, yes. I mean, it cost them so much to, to make. I, but I mean, they must have made <coughs> money out of it. But mm. I don't know I'm right. But uh, there they are. Oh, an another question. Anywhere, please. <laughs> Rainbow one, if you want. No! <laughs> no. <laughs> or not. What else could I tell people about? Oh, no, we haven't done that. Ah. Did you notice a big difference coming back to the show at K9 season 18? Did I notice a difference coming back uh, when I came back to show 18? Um, well, I suppose I noticed a difference in the way K9 was treated in the scripts. Um, he was, uh, they'd obviously um, realised his limitations and had written him down a fair bit. Um, I came back on the assumption that he was going to be written out within the course of a few stories anyway. Um, so that was fine. I mean, John Nathan Turner just rang up and said, you know, would you sort of see him out properly? So I had no... Um, false hopes for the character continuing. But uh, it was very really sad when he did actually go, because East Space is totally <coughs> cold, terribly cold, uh, even though Romana's there, a bit of warmth. But um, <laughs> not a good place to be. Mm. I'm still fascinated by this continuity announcing business. Oh, are you? Mm. Yes. <laughs> well, where do you actually sit to do that? Is there a oh, thing? you sit on a seat. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll leave now. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Channel 4 is uh, as a purpose-built television studio which is on the site of the old Scarlet Theatre in London, in Charlotte Street. Um, the, the presentation area, as such, is really sort of down in the basement, partly to insulate it from ambient noise outside. What you do get, of course, is that uh, uh, all the cars and the streets around, their exhaust fumes get into the... Uh, the building and there the first place they hit is the announcer's booth Ooh. which is rather unpleasant but that's uh, that's another matter so i said well um no no it's not it's not it's, it's the trumpet voluntary by jeremiah clark because i knew these sort of things and um so somebody said oh well bleep <laughs> bleeps down the phone <laughs> and rang off in high dungeon so another satisfied customer. Um, and then I wrote in the duty book what the call had been about. And I was carpeted the following day the, by the presentation organiser who said, John, this call, explain it. You know, what happened? And what, was, what did he hum to you? And I went, ba, 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 ba. Yes, well, um, well, John, I have to tell you, the BBC line on this is that the trumpet voluntary was written by Henry Purcell. <laughs> So I've learned a lot about BBC thinking. Of course, it's since been re-ascribed to Jeremiah Clark. Oh, of course, Absolutely. yes, 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 yes. So, <laughs> but um, I learned a tremendous amount about the way the BBC mind mm. worked, which has stood me in good stead for a few times. <laughs> We've been doing some serious drama, like the Shadow of Manus and all that. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, yes, indeed. Um, I can't remember the name, but what, what was his name, Guy? Just, just played the detective. Yes, I did. But what was the name of um, the... the, the uh, yes. Uh, Edward, Marshall. Edward Marshall Hall. Thank you. Thank you. My son knows most of these things. I don't. Um, Edward Marshall Hall. Very distinguished, sort of off the wall barrister. Very theatrical mm, character. Series about him. But I just played a, a detective, a private detective, um, who was sort of, uh, supposed to uh, run around trying to find, dig up the dirt on a liaison. That had been happening. It was after recording, or yes, we did. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we did them um, after after we recorded a, a thing of the day. We... It's rather obscene, isn't it? It is quite quite obscene. That's quite enough, Kegar. Thank you. Right, uh, but uh, no, I mean, thing which was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's with. Are there a lot of outtakes and things like that still hanging around from the bacon? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, did you film anything specific? I think specific there were or? one or two. Um, I mean, the, the danger always with, with outtakes is to try and artificially create outtakes, mm. and then you lose the, the proper dynamic. Mm. I mean, they cease to become funny, they cease to be real, they cease to have that sweetness, the innocence about them, yeah, which yeah. is rather nice. Did you ever film anything else specific, though? 
No, no. Yeah. Not that I can recall at this this moment of a Sunday morning. <laughs> Anybody else out there? There's various people out there. Yes. Mm. yes. Yes, indeed. But you beat them for it. Well done. Um, not much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was rather nice uh, working with Aubrey Woods and people like that, who was a really sort of um, Grand Guignol style of actors. The wonderful, um, great experience. It was great. Uh, uh, Gambit, I think, is the one that you may be referring to. Um, I think the BBC were a little bit embarrassed by how camp it all was. Um, though there were elements in that that I think that um, the, the establishment were a little sort of uncertain about. But um, no, it, it was certainly fun to do. Jacqueline Pierce, I was at RADA with um, way back. So uh, one was among friends. Anybody else? I know you. I'll, I'll, come, I'll fall back to you. Oh, naturally, that was, oh, no, that was all processed. Right. Yes, that was put through Heinz 57 varieties. That was. Mm. Um, <laughs> but um, K9, of course, I, it was originally processed. It went through uh, ring modulators and all the rest. In fact, I probably think it probably always did. Mm -hmm. But um, I was usually fairly happy to do it without any artificial aids. <laughs> but we like people like that, and we like people. And we like, and a happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrifying. I mean, when you actually do that spool back in a closed studio, and the engineers rush in to find what's happened to the machine. <laughs> how, to, how to confuse a sound engineer. <laughs> how, uh, yeah, there we are, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're still very sensitive. Good Lord. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> oh, good! <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, 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 the composers are watching. <laughs> I do believe um, there's only one lyric, and that's K9. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes, there is indeed. And I went, I went, I think, to uh, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop to do it. <laughs> took a whole morning to say, K9! <laughs> <laughs> Did I actually get into the top 75 at all? I hope not. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear, yes. Anybody else? <laughs> Did you ever actually hear David Bradley's version of voice? No, I didn't. Um, that, that's a, you. Not, oh, oh. No, way. <laughs> no that, that pleasure had not been vouchsafed me, so I, I didn't know what I was following, really. Could you offer him any advice? Did you get to talk to him at all? I'd worked, actually, with David Bryerley on completely different things, like poetry readings and things like that. Um, we worked on an entirely different planet. Um, on various uh, various things, but um, I, I, uh, as when I left Doctor Who, you know, I was I was leaving as it were for good. So I sort of said goodbye. And was only surprised to get called back again and finish it off. And I sort of left let David Riley get on with his own thing, um, because I, I, I don't know whether I should admit it. I'm, I'm not exactly a fan of Doctor Who. Um, this is not heresy necessarily. I'm a professional actor. No, no, no. no, no. Come on, be fair. I'm a professional actor who enjoys what he does. Let's put it that way. Um, I remember being, as most people, being ter absolutely terrified of Doctor Who. When it was, I, I remember the, the Pertwee era, the, the Hart, and uh, the Patrick Troughton era, which was, I think was my favourite. Um, being sort of sitting behind, cowering behind sofas, and generally being terrified. I did some voice work last year um, on a completely different thing, and I met a hulking great actor in his 30s uh, who said, are you John Leeson? So I said, yes, I am. Mr. Leeson, can I shake you by the hand? Yes, if you like. Um, <laughs> do you realize that as canine, you were part of my childhood? Ooh. And I thought, oh, time's <laughs> winging chariot. I'm getting old. This great chap who's higher than me is always... Oh, part of his childhood. Uh, we were talking about open air theatre. I, I spoke to the, the sound engineer who said, what was it like doing open air theatre, which I had done. And when did I last do it? And I said, that was in 1965. He said, oh, I wasn't born until 1971. <laughs> <laughs> He's not old, is he? <laughs> well, how old am I? 
Yes, sir. That's my question to you. <laughs> now that's a poser, because you're going to you you want not to embarrass me. Thirty-five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How's John Major? Well, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it as what? How is John Major? We are the same age. We are actually the same age. Hmm. Yeah. Be good if we could swap. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I don't want to intimidate you. That's a lot to get a high yeah. speech. One down there. What's my favourite? Food. Food. Oh, uh, oh yes. Probably uh, Pinel de Rocher with a sauce nantua. Um, or perhaps, um, oh, I don't know, zucotto. Things like that. Were you asked to make an entry for the Doctor Who cookbook? Yes, I did. I made a brown bread ice cream. Right. Uh, which is lovely. Brilliant. Try it. Um, I cook quite a lot, as, uh, as one member of the audience here will attest to. Um, yes, I enjoy cooking. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Canel de Rocher is a sort of, actually, it's a sort of fish um, dumpling, to put it in its, in its uh, crudest terms. But it's really rather fine. With a with a shellfish sauce, lovely. I think I think that's not note to end on, ladies and gentlemen, John Leeson. I don't know what on earth is coming up next. Some of you. Um, it's actually quite, one very interesting question was just asked of John Leeson, then, which I'm going to ask you to, to throw you completely. What's your favourite food? Mm. Food. Curry. Which sort of curry? Hot, medium? Well, try exactly, probably chicken. But I got spoiled for curries when I filmed in India on Kim, so. What, why was that? Spoiled. I mean, you I just I had so many. I enjoyed it and I enjoyed it more than not bad because they're considerably milder here. Right. And they are in India. Um, earlier this morning, we had on the video screen Space 1999. You, you seem to have done quite a lot of sort of science fiction fantasy work during your career. It, it, was that a, a kind of deliberate thing? Is it something you've always been very fond of? I don't think anything in an actor's career is deliberate. <laughs> it's what comes up. Um, I mean, no deliberate choice to do science fiction machine, but... Is it something you enjoy? Very much, yes. You seem to do quite a lot, because you've done a lot of Fanderson conventions because of your Space 1999 connection and a couple of Doctor Who's. Well, do you enjoy that side of it? It's great fun. I mean, it's a relaxing weekend. I'm always impressed by how friendly everybody is, how many people are interested, and the degree of knowledge that people have of, you know, both, say, Space 1999 and all the other work that uh, Jerry Anderson did, it tends to be a hobby of the same sort of people that come to space convention. There's only been ever one in this country uh, which is a Space 1999 convention. And that tells you something about the series, which was made in the early 70s. The first convention that's happened, I think, was 1991. Uh, they're still interested in the series made that long ago. When you were... Only two series were made, not like Doctor Who, where you had 20, 24, I know. Um, were, were you aware when you were doing Space? I mean, was there ever any thought that this is this is quite a good series and this is going to be really popular? Or was everyone thinking, we'll wait and see what happens? I mean, did it have that buzz right from the word go? Yes, there was, there was a lot of buzz on Space because it had the biggest budget ever at the time. The day we started filming a final, Variety in Hollywood carried a two-page double spread saying, so today, the most expensive television series ever starts with principal photography of crime in London, England. Uh, we had costumes that cost of, I think, of a million pounds by Rudy Gonright, uh, who had <coughs> won world acclaim for designing the top of swimsuit. He was hot property. We had major stars from America, Martin Landau, Barbara Baines, who sort of made their names a mission impossible. We had a marvelous cast of, of people based 
the international cast, if you like, from homegrown talent in this country. Amazing special effects, two studios, four sound stages, a prime and a stage of prey. So yeah, we really thought we, we were going to be around there. Did you get a lot of um, interference from the American side of it? Because presumably they put some money in, which is why you got Barbara Bain and Martin Landau in it. Did, did they sort of come in and say, hey, this program's not American enough? Or? Not, I mean, not so far as I was aware. We had enormous problems uh, because of the state of the country. The country then was going through three day week. And so all industry was working three days a week for the, the power strikes and the miners' strike and all the rest of it. And we were, in fact, the film industry was allowed to work five days a week, provided we provided our own power. Mm -hmm. So Lou Gray got uh, transmitters and what have you down from Birmingham, from ATV, down to Pine, and we carried on working a five day week. We had quite a lot of Italian people coming every week to do their, to do their bit. Thank you very much for that. Very kind of me. Never before, and indeed I have to say since, have I been measured from the navel to the small of the back by the crunch. Now that is a strange, a strange, a curious measurement, I thought. What costume is this, I thought? What am I going to be wearing? I hope it is sufficient. My God, I, I hope the world looks that sufficient. Um, the original costume was fascinating. I don't know if you know this, but it was based, so Jimmy told me, on a He'd been flipping through uh, a medical journal, and he hit upon a, f a, a picture of a four-month-old fetus. He said, oh, I've got my zygote, and it's all based on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I said, the only time I've played anything prenatal. <laughs> played quite a few postnatal things in the way of corpses, you know, something else. Um, that was the first thing. Um, my dear old father, God rest his soul, came to the fitting, the second fitting. We had three fittings, a measurement, then a later fitting. And all the way back, he was very quiet in the car. He'd never been to a television studio before. He said, I'd like to get, in, get in on a bit. He said, I'd like to come and see what you do there, you know, before you actually start working on, on the rehearsals. So I took him along, and he sat there on a table. He was a big man, a very big square man. And he sat there fascinated by me. But on the way back, he kept muttering to himself, You're a lad, you really are, you really are. And I said, What? He said, You're oh, where? And little mutters went on. And when we got back, he couldn't wait to tell my mother what it was he was muttering about. He said, You're not going to believe it. He said, But the wheel mine is there. And he said, There's the, 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 what do you call him, a, a set a dress designer? I said, Yes, sir. Costume designer said, "Yeah, costume designer." He said he was there, and these two, uh, a, a fellow who was a dresser, and this woman. He said this woman was there who, who does all the sorts of pinning and cutting and things, and he took all his clothes off and stood there in his pants in front of this woman. He said, didn't turn a hair. He said, didn't turn a hair. And this is the only thing he remembered of the day. <laughs> Quite astonished. But I stood there in my little underpants. I mean, well, you have to, don't you? I mean, how, how else are you going to get the costume on? So, with my favourite memory, my, favorite, my, my really favourite memory of the whole thing, uh, was when we were on location in a little village outside Bognor, and Dougie, who, as I said yesterday, was something of a military man, and organised everything like a military operation, and he, I said, well, Dougie, we're supposed to be in Scotland. We're supposed to be by Loch Ness. Ah, oh, he said, work it all out, work it out. Wait till you see the location. I said, but Bogner. I said, part of my honeymoon in Bogner. It's a dreadful place. Um, <laughs> I'm, inclined, I'm inclined to echo George, what was supposed to have been George V's last words. Do you, do you know what George V's last words were? Well, I'm sure you must have. Yes, of course. Tell what? Tell no, no, there's a lot of nodding going. Well, the ones who weren't nodding ought to know. Well, I'm not Apparently, nodding. when he was dying, uh, and the physician was supposed to have leant over and said, uh, Sire, Sire, we have great hope uh, of your recovery, and soon you'll be recuperating in Bognor. And 
the king said, bug off, I'm not going to die. Anyway, there we were in, in Bognor, uh, or outside Bognor, this little village, and Dougie said, yeah, oh, he said, it's fine, we've got pine, pine trees, fir trees, just like Scotland, and he said, there's a wonderful stone in, it's true, it looks a bit Bognorish, he said, but we'll put tartan curtains up. And, and, <laughs> and he said, upstairs, we'll, we'll play a bit of piping. <laughs> So there we were, up with this great big wardrobe, traps and things, and of course you arrive looking like this, uh, and, which is ludicrous. And you get in, and you get in, the, in, in the wardrobe van, and on you trample all your stuff, and you've never worn it before. And you say, what are all these little fittings inside? They say, oh, Dougie's got this great idea of you having little light bulbs inside. And the chap was supposed to follow me around with a car battery, with a thing up my leg, uh, which connected all these lights, so that when I got angry, he, he pulsated a switch, which went boom, 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 boom. But they fell about so much in the gallery, they decided it, it couldn't be done. Which was a good thing, because it was like a portable Turkish bath. <laughs> no all these lights on, Dougie hadn't thought about it. no ventilation. I was frying inside, so I was very relieved when they cut that. But the real memory, really, is, is putting it all on, on location, and it was a dreadfully, dreadfully hot summer day. Terribly hot. And the, the chest part, uh, and the, the top of the legs was fiberglass, hard up, and it gets jolly hot in there. And the, the, the mask, the face, was fiberglass at the top, and then latex, so that it would fit around the mouth. And makeup were very clever; they, they disguised it awfully well, the, the, the joint, so that you were able to move your lips and your own eyes. But they were the only things that were real. All the rest was fiberglass and latex. So it was pretty hot, and it was difficult eating. And also, you wiped off all your makeup. That didn't matter. You could have that done again. But it was dreadfully hot. And Dougie, with his usual enthusiasm, said, Charles, how's it going? Looking splendid, all the stuff with it. Wonderful, wonderful arms away from all over the bed. And he said, you look terribly hot. I said, I, 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 He said, well, I spoke to the landlord in the pub, and you can go in there, and he doesn't mind, in costume, and, and have your interest. So I said, fine. So I went in and, and there was a wonderful man wearing um, a, a blazer, uh, not unlike this, but with big brass buttons and a huge crest uh, here. And he was obviously a member of some big club and was obviously an either an ex-military man or an ex-naval man with one of the world's most expensive faces, you know. He, he, he'd run quite a bit to get like that and a huge moustache. And by now, he was all, all about his 12th gin and tonic, I should think, and I imagine they were doubles. And he was lecherously peering down the cleavage of the young makeup girl who'd come in for a glass of lemonade and his evil. What are you going to have, my dear? Uh, <laughs> Jessie, give my little friend here whatever she'd like, and I'll have uh, another cup of the same or something like that. So she called out. I came up behind him on the other side and said, That's Guinness, please. I'm going to find a Guinness. So, Barbie uh, pulls my pipe. It takes quite a long time to come on. And his arrives, and he says, Well, here you are, my dear. Cheers, like that. And turns like that, and looks straight at me, and went, Ah! <laughs> put it down and left the pub. <laughs> he obviously thought he was seeing them, you know. If there had been three of them, <laughs> I had two of them. That would have been it, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's three Daleks up there. Is that a You must have been
those of you who've heard the Ahmed story, which is obviously most of you since so. <laughs> <laughs> Any people who haven't heard the Ahmed story? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Stephen and I know very well called Richard Wortley. 
But again, on radio, I was playing a sort of military character. Can't get away from it. You know, it was, a, it was uh, all, all about Hans Kohlhaas, which is all to do with um, Lupo's. Yeah. And that was, but it was Stephen sort of, who sort of prompted the idea in my mind about radio. It's very dangerous recommending friends who are very good actors. So that's why you wrote the Nick instead. Your work. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't do anything. Yeah, uh, the new. So, uh, so you owe Stephen a favour then, really? Oh, several. Oh, he's repaid it many times. As he, as he does. <laughs> I can imagine he probably would have done. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have a question for any of these three marvellous gentlemen? I say that she got the job. Mm. Can, can you remember anything about what the scene was? I remember I had to chase her around the desk. As some <laughs> awful, monstrous sort of nasty creature. Uh -huh. Without the aid of makeup. And was this um, was this just with with Liz Lane, yeah, or was just with a number Liz, of? Yeah. Oh, so it was quite late on in the yeah. selection I process. I think it was the sort of final third. Yeah. If you can cope with Stephen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I remember that morning because we were rehearsing. I think Invasion of the Dinosaurs. No, no, we couldn't because Liz was in there. But we were rehearsing one of the hoops, mm -hmm. and I remember and uh, Pertley said, "You girl being tried after Katie left, and you know that." And the buzz went round the rehearsal room, and. Um, there was Liz doing that scene with Stephen. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I didn't see either of them. Well, I saw them. Well, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't think I saw either of them that day. But I remember when it happened. Yes. During one of my stories of Doctor Who, there being yes. so many. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, perhaps it was The Green Death, which was Katie Manning's last. I, I don't know. Could well be, Nick. Well guessed. Mm. Well guessed. I have been all impressed with that. Um, I worked with Barry Letts recently in a, a single episode of EastEnders. Uh huh. Which he directed. Very happy meeting mm -hmm. with him. Who, who were you playing in EastEnders? I played a consultant paediatrician. Oh. And, uh, he wouldn't have noticed really. Well, <laughs> you knew you were a consultant paediatrician, but the audience didn't notice. Whenever I have a miscarriage. That's right. Oh, I yes. I'm afraid I'm cell it. disease. Uh huh. Oh, I see. So that was nice to meet back. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You have any, any uh, aspirations to be in soap operas, James? Or Nick? Oh, I have. I want to be in Coronation Street, but I never will be. Dying to be in Coronation Street. Well, I'm not sure that you never will be. You, you, you may be. No, I can't see it. But no. I'd like to be. Mm -hmm. But I won't be. If they started up another war, yeah. and you could get the Coronation Street people called up to do military service, you'd be there for the Would you write to um, <laughs> Mervyn Watson, whoever's the producer of the poet? Yeah, Mervyn Watson is going to bring to war. No, 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 no. They can be very dangerous um, soap operas. When I was <laughs> <laughs> briefly in, in um, Crossroads for three months, I was walking through, I played a rather nasty police superintendent, and I was wa walking to work in Birmingham to the rehearsal rooms one spring morning, the sun was shining, birds were singing. It was sort of joy in my stride as I marched along. And I was approached by a little old lady in a woolly hat. And you know the way you know when someone's going to speak to you and stop you. I thought she's going to speak to me. Perhaps she, she recognised me, because this was all very new to me. Mm. And indeed, she did stop me. And she said, you're the superintendent, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she went, and pow! <laughs> <laughs> and scuttled off down the road. And it smashed me in the head. Like <laughs> well, really, it's just as well you were underneath all that latex when you were bizarre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm blowing up churches. I mean, yeah. Great heavens. And I arrived at the rehearsal room and I said, guess what's happened to me? And everybody said, oh, I've had my windscreen smashed, somebody else had had their tyres smashed, somebody else had been spat on. I thought, oh my God, it can't be a lot of Great show to work on. <laughs> then it, it, when, when uh, you know, doing Doctor Who or something like that, you, you do the episode, you know, you, you do the what you're in the studio. What is very nice is that you reassemble the next day. It's mm. not the end of the job. Mm. You have a, and I, I mean, I, I, mm. I was in the secret army for a short while, and it was very nice to meet up again, you know, and mm. like Doctor Who. But um, the secret army, of course, they could never do it again, because uh, if they put it on, everybody would think it was LOLO, and everybody would yes. call them They've really got it remarkably close to the original, even the set design. Aren't they on a low low, it's very similar to. It's the same about. thing yeah. with the same it cafe. On a, a cafe. Mm. Yes. Who, who ever in Secret Army, Stephen? 
No. We're going for Blind Alley here. I seem to remember seeing Green and they said, no, no, quite well, we'll skip by that one. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? I'd like to ask a question of, of the fans. How often do you watch episodes and how many episodes and which stories? That's about 15 questions. Mm, several. But I mean, do you watch all the time? Yes. Yeah. Regularly? Yeah. yeah. And what, what are your favourites? Oh, um, it's difficult to say. I mean, you can't really say what, what's a favourite. Well, which doctor do you like best? Well, personally, I like Trout. Patrick Pratt and Fest, but um, then the others are all on the same sort of level. Should we, should we, should we have a vote? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's have a quick one. Okay, ready? Okay. <laughs> so, I may right. say, Jimmy, well done, because you, I've heard all those questions of who's your favourite doctor, Mr. Corney, or whatever. Yeah. And well done, you asked the audience. Yeah. Right. Very right. clever, shrewd. <laughs> Revenge of the guests. Okay, here we go then. We'll go through, we'll go through the seven telly doctors, okay? Uh, one vote each. Here we go. Hartnell? Okay. Well, that's not, that's not a very good start. Well, I'll, I'll play one. Trout. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. Okay. Pertwee. Oh. <laughs> oh, I see. Is this? Uh, Tom. Who's next? Davison. Peter. Oh, a couple of Peter Davisons. Yes. Colin Baker. Brave man. A brave man, sir. Sylvester McCoy. And another one. Well, I think that was a bit of a, that was probably Troughton. Could have been a toss-up between Troughton and Tom, but I'm not sure. Well, there we are. <coughs> Never done that before at a convention. That's informative. That's very informative. Yes, thank you. Oh, Peter Cushing, oh, by the way, as well, in the films. No? No, all right. Uh, sorry to mention it. Um, and, of course, Terry Walsh every now and then as well. Um, oh, from time to time. Yes, yes. Is he the one that does it on the stage? Terry Walsh, he, he was um, there. He doubles, he used to double for John. Oh, yeah. Mm. And the Tom used to double for Danny Kay. He used to double for Danny Kay. I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't, I don't think. Yes. Yes, well, it's the Hooter, isn't it? I mean, the Hooter is the same, isn't it? All the long shots in that film that was made, that he made over here. What was it called? I can't remember what it was called. No. Oh, John Pertwee. The film that John Pertwee made? No, the Danny Kay. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. In London. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Film that Danny Kay made in London, anyone? Oh, Sorry, Gordon? Knock on wood. That's it. Knock on wood. John Pertwee is in all the long shots. Is that so? Yeah. Well, there's one to, you there's one to look at. <laughs> well, well, well. Did, uh, did Danny Kay ever double for John Pertwee in Doctor Who, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know that episode where the doctor was wrapped up with a lot of plastic? Oh, yes. That was Danny Kaye. No. No. That probably blew the whole season's budget. That's why we didn't get paid much. Yes. Now, with the possible exception of Stephen, you've all been both goodies and baddies in Doctor Who. What's... What's the attraction of, uh, of either or both of those? Do you prefer goodies and baddies? Uh, goodies to baddies, rather, I should say? I think baddies are more fun to play. I always thought that. But don't forget that baddies are goodies to themselves. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm. He was. I had a lot of... No wonder I saluted him when I went down that thing, you know. Yeah. He was quite a sad chap, really, wasn't he? He was very sad. He had a point. He had, he had a point of view. Definitely, Amiga. Mm. Mm. He did indeed. Yes. He missed Mrs. Amiga. Mrs. Amiga. Yes. Well, she couldn't bear men with no heads, presumably. No. No, she wasn't caught out. <laughs> <laughs> but nice try, Jimmy. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patty, I think in between figure in, in Trial of a Time Lord. Yes. Uh, well, it, it, I was going to say that it depends upon the writer, really. If he's written you a nice part as a goodie, that is very nice to play. If he's written you a nice part as a baddie, that is nice to play. I mean, you can have the bad, badly or inadequately written parts as baddies or, or as goodies. You know, it, it depends what you're offered, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I think. For the opportunities that they present.
If I can ask another sort of similar sort of question, which may actually have a similar sort of answer, so if it has, do tell me to shut up and ask something else. Do you have a preference? Oh. <laughs> do you have a preference uh, for um, which? Me, I know I asked this to Stephen yesterday, but um, radio, television, theatre, film. Down and I could see his hand go out of his body and twist. 
and I thought, oh dear, I know he's damaged, so I rushed on not as the character, as his sister, because Charles is my little brother. If anyone comes near Charles or you know, threatens him, I hit them. I mean, really, it's one of those, because we're very close. So I rushed down these stairs, and I'm saying under my breath, Charles, 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 are you all right? Are you all right? He's going, oh, 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 like this. I'm saying, get up, get up, get up, are you all right? And then I, I didn't get down about the play, just seeing my brother's all right. And he put his hand out, the one that was hurt, and I stood straight on it with my stiletto and you. <laughs>
I would have got some more lines then, but I've never seen the arc. <laughs> 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 In the orchard! Oh my god! What game for everyone? I think I'm going to say that the old last one was pretty hard. I'm going to say that the old last one was pretty hard. I'm going to say that the old last one was pretty hard. I'm going to say that the old last one was pretty hard.